Every school day for 10 days, I'm giving you something you can do to kickstart your students' sense of numbers and increase their fluency with mathematics. Welcome to Build Math Minds, the podcast, where fidelity to your students is greater than fidelity to your textbook. I'm your host, Christina Tonnevold, the recovering traditionalist and buildmathminds.com founder, where my mission is to change the way we teach elementary math to our kiddos. So are you ready to start building math minds and not just creating calculators? Let's get started. So over the next two weeks on this podcast, I'm giving you an action step you can take towards building your students' number sense and increasing their fluency with mathematics. This does not mean that your students will magically have number sense and fluency by the end of our two weeks, but we will have kickstarted it and you'll have a roadmap to keep building it throughout this school year. This is day one of the kickstart, so let's kickstart your students' number sense by making sure you've got the number sense kickstart checklist. This is the checklist of the 10 things you can do to kickstart number sense this year. If you are already signed up for the kickstart, you should have gotten an email with it. If you aren't signed up, head over to buildmathminds.com slash 10 day dash kickstart. And the 10 is the number 10. And then we'll send it on over to you via email. If you have any issues with emails not getting to you, please make sure you email us at info at buildmathminds.com so we can ensure you get everything you need to kickstart number sense this year. All right, you ready to kickstart number sense? Let's dig in to day one. Your first step to kickstarting number sense this year is to ensure your lessons are focused on helping students understand math and not just doing math. When I first started teaching, all I had was the knowledge of how to do math. I thought that was enough to be able to teach it. Within my first years of teaching, I discovered that it wasn't. However, I really didn't know what I was missing. Just that I didn't quite know how to help the students who quote unquote weren't getting it. And what I mean by weren't getting it is that they weren't able to follow the steps that I had laid out for them in the lesson. I was the traditional style of teacher. I walked the class through the steps on how to solve a type of problem. We did some problems together. Then I had them practice those problems on their own. This is now called I do, we do, you do format of teaching, or some people also know it as the gradual release method. In this style of teaching, the teacher is the bearer of all the knowledge. We know it all and our job is to impart that knowledge to our students and then get them to kind of parrot it back to us. It doesn't matter if they really understand what they're doing, just that they can do it and get correct answers. That was the traditional way of teaching. A prime example of this is the common saying that we sometimes use when we try to teach students to divide with fractions. Ours is not to question why, just invert and multiply, right? (laughs) I'm ashamed, I have used that before. By focusing on getting students to do the procedures of mathematics, we often strip out the understanding of the math. We want students to get correct answers and be able to do the math, don't get me wrong here, but they also need to understand it. I've been on this journey to improve my knowledge about teaching math for over 20 years. I don't know it all. I even call myself a recovering traditionalist, and I run the site recoveringtraditionalist.com. A recovering traditionalist is anyone who taught mathematics traditionally in that they were only teaching kids the steps and procedures and had kids memorize things, but you're now working to teach in a way that builds children's conceptual understandings as well. So if you align with that idea, feel free to call yourself a recovering traditionalist as well. One big thing I learned along my journey is that it isn't enough to just know how to add, subtract, multiply, divide. We teach the kids these steps and procedures to do those things, but then they encounter a problem they aren't quite sure how to solve, and then they say to us, Miss, you didn't teach us how to solve this problem. There is no way for us to teach them how to solve every problem that we'll ever (laughs) encounter. So yes, they do need to know how to add, subtract, and multiply, divide, but they also need to be able to think. Their ability to think through problems is dependent on their understanding of how numbers work. 
the book that I call my math Bible is one of the places that I, that helped change my thinking about what the teaching and learning of mathematics should be like. On page one in the opening paragraph of Teaching Student-Centered Mathematics by John Vandewall, Luann Levin, Karen Karp, and Jennifer Bay Williams, they write, what is understanding? Understanding is being able to think and act flexibly with a topic or concept. It goes beyond knowing. It is more than a collection of information, facts, or data. It is more than being able to follow a steps in a procedure. One hallmark of mathematical understanding is a student's ability to justify why a given mathematical claim or answer is true or why a mathematical rule makes sense. Although children might know their basic multiplication facts and be able to give you quick answers to questions about these facts, they might not understand multiplication. They might not be able to justify how they know an answer is correct or provide an example of when it would make sense to use this basic fact. These tasks go beyond simply knowing mathematical facts and procedures. Understanding must be a primary goal for all of the mathematics you teach. Now, many of us were taught math in a way that only gave us the knowledge of the steps and procedures. Maybe you were even one who memorized your multiplication facts, but you had no idea what three times seven actually meant. Whatever the math concept was, many of us were only ever taught math in a way that is seen as a set of information to be learned and memorized. Thus, we teach math the same way we were taught. We were taught to focus only on the doing of mathematics. So, how do we ensure students are building an understanding and not just parroting back what we've shown them? One of the best ways is to not show them. <laughs> Another book that totally changed my perspective on teaching mathematics was Children's Mathematics Cognitively Guided Instruction by Carpenter et al. You can Google to find out details about cognitively guided instruction, but the summary, and this is a very short summary, is that teachers worked with K through third grade teachers to help them understand mathematical word problems or math in context. Then they had those teachers only give their students word problems and see what their students did. That's right, they gave kindergarten through third graders story problems without the teacher's direct instruction on how to solve them. They gave them problems like, Christina had $15. She earned seven more. How much does she have now? but replace those numbers with ones that work for the different grades. And then they just had their students solve them any way they could. They drew pictures, they used manipulatives, and some just solved it in their head. But by giving the students the opportunity to show how they think about the numbers, you start to see what they actually understand about numbers and how to solve problems in real life scenarios. Now the teachers involved in, in the CGI study didn't just do this once in a while, their whole instructional time was giving kids contextual problems, letting them solve them, and then talking about the ways that kids solve them. I'm not going to go in depth about the power of this style of teaching. We'll actually talk a little bit more about it in day eight of this 10 day kickstart. But for now, I want to encourage you to look at your upcoming lessons. Are they focused on the doing or the understanding of math? Now, one of the main ways to tell is by looking at whether or not the lesson is making students follow certain steps to solve the problems. I've got an example that I'll try to explain on here, but it's better if you actually see it. So make sure that you're signed up to get the emails for this 10 day number sense kickstart, kickstart at buildmathminds.com slash 10 day dash kickstart. When you sign up, You'll get an email that gives you a link to the website that we're using to put all the resources for the 10 days. And you can see the image of these two worksheets that I'm going to try to describe here. So the first week worksheet is definitely focused on doing. It is wanting the students to break apart a number to add it to another number. It shows an example problem at the top showing the steps to add 29 plus 52 by breaking off a 1 from the 52 and giving it to the 29, and then that makes the problem 30 plus 51. It also shows how you could use those same numbers but take an 8 from the 29 to make the problem 21 plus 60. Then below in the practice problems for the students, it says, take apart an add-in to solve. So first off, if your lesson gives the students the strategy that they're supposed to use, 
that is your first sign that it's focused on the doing of mathematics. Okay, so not only does it tell them what strategy to use, it also has pre-made equations that they just have to fill in the blanks along the way with arrows showing what number they're supposed to break apart. So not only are they telling them what strategy to use, but they're also dictating which number to break apart, even though the example that they show showed that you could use either number. And then they're giving kids the blank spaces to fill in. This is a prime example of just wanting kids to do the steps of a procedure and is so not focused on understanding. The second image is an example of focusing on understanding in a worksheet. It has an image of some coins and says the money jar has these five coins in it. And then it shows the picture. And then it says, what is the total value of the coins? It has lots of space underneath that for kids to work out the problem, and it does not give advice on how, to, how, how they should go about adding the coins. Problems like this help you see what your students understand because there isn't a preset way that they need to solve it. The coins are two pennies, then a quarter, another penny, and then a nickel. So first off, you get to see if they know the value of the coins or not, but then you also get to see what they understand about those amounts. Do they just start with the two cents and then add the five cents and then the one and then the five? Or do they know that combining that 25 and the five would make it so much easier? The goal of both of these worksheets is the same. Get kids to combine amounts to make it easier to add. However, in the first one, you have kids following steps and filling in the blanks so you don't really know if they understand. And in the second one, you're getting to actually see which of your students understands about combining numbers and how to make them a bit more friendly when they're adding. The second worksheet does have another problem. It asks the students, what is, what is a different combination of coins that adds up to the same amount? Again, you're going to get to see what your students understand about numbers and about the value of coins. This is by no means the only way to tell if a lesson focuses on understanding instead of doing, but it is a quick way that you can look at your lessons to, to, to determine what the focus is. So your to do from today is to look over your lesson for tomorrow. Take note if it is doing or understanding math. That's it, that's all you gotta do tonight. But if you wanna take today's tip even further, then if your lesson for tomorrow is focused on the doing of math, change it. If it's asking the students to solve a problem in a specific way, get out the whiteout and delete that. Just ask the kids to solve and see what they can do. Now, I will caution you, when I first started doing this, my students looked at me like a deer in headlights. They didn't know which way to go. I had always told them how to solve problems. So if this is new to you and your students, just know that it's gonna take some prompting and just assure them that you'd like to see how they approach the problem without any guidance from you. It's okay for them to use manipulatives, draw pictures, whatever they need. When you start to make this change, it is weird for the students and for you, but it is a necessary first step to kickstart their number sense. Again, the day one tip is to look over your lesson for tomorrow Note it, if it is doing or understanding math. And if you want to take it even further, take a look at your lesson. And if it's focused on doing, change it. Delete any reference to solving problems in a certain way and just ask the kids to solve it and see what they can do. So a reminder, if you have not joined us yet for this 10-day Number Sense Kickstart, go to buildmathminds.com slash 10, that's the number, 10 day dash kickstart to sign up. I'll email you the checklist and the link to the resources page. This is just day one and we've got nine more days of tips to help you start the year off with a solid mathematical foundation for your students. That's all for day one and I'll see you back here tomorrow for day two.